get the podium to talk to my computer. I guess it doesn't like it very much or something. Who knows? All right. Well, I'm Dr. Kennedy, and uh, I've been teaching here at UNM for a while, and I've taught cell and molecular a lot, and I love this class. It's a lot of fun. I, I will admit this is my first time back in the classroom in almost two years, so I was looking forward to it. You know, it's unfortunate there's this raging pandemic going on at the same time. So for those of you that have seen my emails, I um, I am live streaming. I actually have people. Yep, good. People are coming back onto the live stream here. So if you feel unsafe coming into class, you can watch the live stream, and it's actually looking pretty good on this right here. Uh, you know, the university really didn't give us a choice with 800,000 new cases a day, which is pretty high. I don't know about you, but I've got two unvaccinated children at home, so I'm going to give you the choice of whether or not you want to come to class or not at least for the next few weeks or probably a month. And that also means that the first test and likely the second test will be online. Okay. It'll be the, the, so that way you don't have to come to class for any reason. So if you want to come to class because you're like me, you like being in class and you like interacting with people and seeing live lectures and you are seriously tired of YouTube and zoom meetings, you know, <laughs> I have some pretty ser serious zoom fatigue. Um, come on to class and you know, don't hesitate to come in, right? But if you do feel unsafe or you've got loved ones at home or family members or friends or just for yourself, you don't have to be here. We're good? Okay, so uh, I had all this stuff up on my computer. Let me pull it up for you really quick. I do have a social media presence. Uh, one of them is called, called Tom Kennedy Science. And it pops up right there. There's my YouTube channel. This is where I will be live streaming my videos. Just look for the live stream feed. You can hop on. I won't be able to answer. Well, here I might be able to answer questions. Uh, I'll have a playlist that says cell and molecular biology for you guys. So I've got lots of videos that I've, I've made for all of my classes from cell and molecular, ecology evolution, plant animal form and function, and then I also have other stuff I do for fun, like um, I, I did this one. Let's see if it, Carrington Products. See, I'm not signed into my YouTube. Oh, skip ads, come on. So I like doing videography. Um, this, is the Rio, this is some drone footage I took of the Rio Grande River up in Colorado, up at its headwaters. You guys know it starts in Southern Colorado, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. This is the mountains that it starts and the Rio Grande is dependent on like snowfall. So I hiked to the headwaters there and flew my drone over the, over the headwaters of the Rio Grande. There it is. So that's further down south. And then of course it dies. Fish die every year. This is our Rio Grande. Did you guys know it dries? Yeah. There it is. That's our mighty river. But at any rate, I've got this YouTube channel, and I will I'll be posting all my live lectures on here, and uh, they'll be recorded. So if you if you miss class and uh, you can't watch it. In real time, it'll be on here. Good. And I'll be making other videos for the class as well. Okay, how many of you like podcasts? Yeah. Um, guess what? I have a podcast. Okay, I prefer Spotify. I think Spotify changed my life. Hey, who's on Spotify? Excellent. I like it because you can see the artwork that I, I picked out for the for the different uh, lectures. So this is my this is on Spotify, but you can get it on uh, anywhere you get your podcast. But basically, I've been podcasting some of my lectures, not just like it's a lecture, but an actual like podcast format. And uh, I'll actually have today's and Thursday's lectures a podcast probably up by tomorrow. I've already recorded it; I just have to edit it. 
And uh, so this is my uh, my podcast. It's not required that you listen to a podcast. It's optional, but it's there for those of you that like to hear podcasts. You can hear my lectures, or it's not exactly my lectures. I'm podcasting it. It's different, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. And uh, it'll be here. And I'll also, in Learn, if you notice, let's see here. And learn. I'm starting to do it. There's my lecture material week one, week two. I'll have eight weeks. And then so here I'll post everything for the week. So if there's a YouTube video that you want to watch or for the class, it'll be there. The podcast, if I have one for the week, it'll be there along with the PowerPoints and everything. Good. Yeah. And like I said, the podcasts are optional. They're, they're there to help you guys out to hear the material elsewhere. And I've actually got one posted. It's called How Science Works, What We Learn from Studying Exercise on Weight Loss. And I'm like, this is optional, but uh, I talked a lot about how I had my, my preconceptions completely overturned in the last few years about the role of exercise on weight loss. And uh, man, I, I've, I've had my heels dug in pretty good for about two decades on that one and finally, finally changed my mind but this kind of shows about how science works and how science can help inform us. Don't worry. Doing exercise is vitally important for your health. It just might not help you lose weight like you think it might, but it will still improve your health. Okay. So, yep, there's my YouTube channel. I've got, uh, it's got me signed in here to my account, but you can see it's Tom Kennedy Science, Tom Psychast, and then, um, uh, I also have, if I can spell, sorry about that. This antiquated website here called Facebook. Um, I do have a Facebook page. You know, when I, was in, when I was in graduate school, this was cutting edge. And before that, there was MySpace, right? You guys probably never even heard of MySpace. Wait, that's retro. You might know about it. Um, once again, this is optional. You know, one of the things that I like to post on here, I've been kind of away from it for a while, but it's fun to post stuff to me that's really fun that I've talked about in class and we can, I can give you an article on something we're talking about or an article that I think is really fun. Like they just discovered methane on Mars. Well, not really just discovered, they've known methane has been on Mars and methane, you know, is an organic molecule, right? carbon and hydrogen, and it can be made by life or it can be made by geological processes. And the question is, well, where did this methane come from? Who's making it? Is it just geology or did something biological do it? And there's ways that we can get at that answer. And perseverance is kind of like, it could be biology, could be biology. So this was a kind of a fun article to post. So that's what I'm doing on Facebook. If anybody wants to up on there and see what I'm posting. And some of the material will be relevant for the class. We good? Okay. So that's my social media presence. Like I said, the only one that, that you'll probably want, would be interested in the most, besides the podcast, is the, is the YouTube channel, because like I said, I, I do um, post lectures on there for the class. And the podcast is optional. All right. And like I said, I live stream the class and I'll also post the links. Once I get done, I'll post the links for the lectures here. This is week one. So everything for like each week will be in there. And like I said, there's a raging pandemic, 800,000 people. The university refused to go um, remote. So if you for any reason feel unsafe coming to class, you do not have to come to class even to take a test at least for the first test, likely the second test. Good. When Kuhn takes over after uh, spring break, he will reevaluate the situation and uh, make a decision of whether or not he's going to continue the live streaming or the, in, or the remote test. He might go back to uh, in-person tests, so you might want to expect that when you come back. Good? Yeah. Part of my reasoning is... is um, going in person with 800,000 cases a day with the most virulent uh, virus in the history of humans. I don't know about that decision. And I have two unvaccinated children at home 
because they're too young to be vaccinated. So I was, I'm trying to give you guys a choice that I wasn't, and actually the university is not giving us, not the university, the administration. Okay. Are we good? All right. And Kuhn didn't go over the syllabus, did he? All right. Let's see here. Course information. Let's see if the syllabus is there. Yep. Okay. It's pretty straightforward, the syllabus. I, I don't want to go over it verbatim, but just really quick, uh, there's a schedule. I'm going to do chapters one through seven. We're going to learn about um, what is life. We're going to learn a little bit about how science works. In fact, I'm very excited to talk about some of the examples I have. Uh, we'll talk about the chemistry of life from water base and carbon chemistry to carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and nucleic acids. And then we're going to talk a lot about membranes and transport across those membranes. And then we, I will end up the last week and a half on cells because I'll be honest, the eukaryotic cell is just fascinating. It is so wild learning about all those organelles and a cytoskeleton and how all of these things work together inside this tiny little cell. And uh, yeah, just absolutely fascinating. And one thing you'll learn is that, you know, life is cellular, right? And it's based on chemistry. So here we are in cell and molecular biology. We get to learn about the very basic foundations of life. And to me, that's just fascinating stuff. I get, I get excited thinking about this stuff. So yeah, I, I might get ahead. I might get a little behind on the weeks. It's not a big deal. We will cover up from chapters one through seven. Good? We'll get through it. Yeah. When will we have access to the syllabus? You know, I, I don't understand why you don't have access. I've, I've been told that. I'm sitting here looking at it right there. And it's under, so it's under course information. And. Oh, you know what? You don't. You don't have anything. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Guess what? You can see it now. <laughs> oh, guys, I am so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. That's my fault. They uh, the, they copied the course from the last spring, and then I realized every all the stuff from the, like two years ago is on there, and I'm like, that's not our class. You know, I just hit everything. You can see it now. And so when you go into course information, you can scroll, yeah. Okay, there it is, under lectures. Yeah, so that's it. So the syllabus is under course information. There's my material under lectures. This is my view, but it'll look like that. And then you just go in there and that will be everything. Are we good? No? Course information? I might have to give it a second. Um, like I said, I just made it available. So let's check it at the end of class and see what we got. All right. And then let's see here. I'll pull this back up here. So throughout the test, I mean, sorry, it's my third lecture in a row. Throughout the semester, you're going to have four tests. OK, like I said, the first one, you can just count on it being online, likely the second one as well. And then you've got two after this. And your grade is based on the best three out of four tests, except for the final test four. It's cumulative. It's the final exam. You got the idea. You can't drop it, but you can drop one through three. OK, and then the first one, almost certainly the second one will be, be online. But don't take them lightly. You'll, I'll expect you to uh, sit down with your notes, computer, book, whatever resources and research your answers. I, they're not timed or anything like that. They're, they're open for like four days. So you have four days to take them. Uh, that's plenty of time to sit down and, and think about your answers a bit. I, I don't like time to test online and I think Respondus is too creepy. Really, seriously, I mean, somebody's watching you. Like, you drop your pencil and does it think you're cheating? <laughs> All right. Maybe that'll work. Okay. So we good with the syllabus? 
One other thing, you'll have a homework assignment. There's going to be a total of 10 homework assignments, five from me, five from Dr. Adama. Uh, you'll get the first one next week. There's no labs or discussion groups this week. You'll answer your discussion, your homeworks in your discussion. That's 25% of your grade. 75% is based on your three out of four tests. Straightforward. We're all good here? All right. Excellent. Okay. Well, you can read the rest of it. Don't cheat. I mean... On your test, I mean, the way you're going to get caught cheating is if you cut and paste to the Wikipedia or you guys hand in the same answers, we'll catch you. I mean, we run it through Turnitin and it tells us your 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 answer was 75 percent from this or this student or this website. And if you pull it up and yeah, it's, it's easy to catch it. So don't do that. Write in your own words. Good. All right. That's easy enough. OK. Let's pull up week one. Let's go to the lecture here. All right. Unfortunately, I just kind of redid this PowerPoint this morning. I didn't redo it. I just jazzed it up a little bit so it looked a little nicer. Um, but it won't communicate with my computer for some reason. I'll have to figure that out. Okay, before I get started, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you don't like the sound of somebody chewing gum? Oh boy, yeah. Does it drive you crazy? Uh huh. You have, like me, something that's called misophonia. That's M I S O, it means hatred of sound. I can't stand to hear somebody chew gum, pop gum, tap a pencil, or strike on a keypad. Typing, bad. So in my class after today, I would ask that uh, nobody bring a laptop to class to uh, type on. And there are several reasons for that. One is, is it affects me? Second, how many of you raise your hand again? Yeah, how many of you had these sound issues? Yeah, it's like 10 to 15, maybe even 20% of the population. So if you're striking on a keypad, you are affecting people around you and their ability to concentrate and hear. And for me, I have weird hearing things. I can't hear anything with noise. So if somebody's typing on a keypad next to me, I hear zero. So I'm going to ask that nobody uh, bring laptops into class to type on. And secondly, this is not just for me, not just for your classmates, but for you. There are really good studies that have shown that the difference between students typing on a keypad versus writing, that the students that write their notes out from a lecture retain much more information to somebody dictating on a keypad. So it's actually in your best interest to not take notes on a laptop. Now, lots of you have uh, notepads or, or, or whatever those notepads are and you're writing on your notes digitally, that's fine. So if you've got like an iPad and you're, and you're writing notes on your iPad, that is absolutely fine. But the striking of the keypad is not only uh, causes problems with people with sound issues, it, um, you, you just don't remember as much. So it's in your best interest to, to, to write. Good? Okay. All right. Now, let's talk some science here. So these are our learning objectives. We won't get through all of these today, and we're going to start them. Uh, we're going to talk about the nature and limitations of science, the importance of science and critical thinking in our everyday lives. Yeah, you, you guys probably heard this bill before. Uh, we're also going to talk about life. What makes life unique? What makes life different from something living? And we're going to talk about three important theories that explain how life kind of works or governs life. Good? All right. One more thing. And um, how many of you have, have uh, looked through your textbook already? Yeah, a few of you, yeah. Do you like your textbook? Is it nice? Is it exciting to read? Is it, you know what, I mean, you can answer honestly. I'm not, I, I didn't choose a textbook. It's okay, right? Maybe, yes, nothing. The textbook is a great source of knowledge. It is an encyclopedia of knowledge with some examples that the authors like. And it's about as accurate as a Wikipedia. 
wait, did I just, who did I just diss on? The Wikipedia or the textbook? The answer is neither. They're both really good. They're both good sources. The Wikipedia is an excellent source of information. Don't let anybody tell you anything different, especially for the sciences. Your textbook is also a good source of information. But as I can see the excitement in the room about your textbook, <laughs> it's not always the most fun thing to read. So I'm going to cover the material in the textbook, but I might not cover it exactly point for point in the textbook. I'm going to give you examples of things that I'm really interested in. So the textbook, for example, when it talks about how you do science, it talks about learning how giraffes' necks are long. I'm going to go ahead and spill the beans for you because the males are fighting, not because they're reaching up for plants. Or the ants navigate by counting their legs, how many steps they take. I do that too. I have a step maker on my phone here. I better put in, get all my steps in while I lecture, you know? <laughs> right? So I'm going to give you some information and examples that are not in the book. I might not go over every example in the book or every point they make. And I might go beyond the book and talk about things that are not there. And that's part of coming to class. And, you know, each one of us, me and Dr. Adama, he studies infectious diseases. I studied ecology evolution and I love natural history and I'm really into diet and exercise and astrobiology. I know very different in evolution of life and all these different things in earth history. So by coming to class, you're not just reading a book, you're getting our own personal examples and our own personal interests. And I think that's really fun. And I think that's one of the values of coming to class. So I'm going to expand on chapter one quite a bit. So for me, when we talk about, uh, instead of learning about giraffes and ants, we're going to learn about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We're going to learn about the search for ET, looking for life outside the Earth, diet and exercise, and natural history. Okay, any questions? Okay. Let's start with this uh, nature and limitations of science. It's a good one to start with, right? You guys like that? Any Star Trek fans in here? Excellent, excellent. Wow, all right. Nice, nice. I, I wear it proudly. I like Star Trek, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, The Expanse. I like sci-fi history and fantasy and pop culture. I love this. This is a giant sea turtle with, short, with a elephant standing on its back with a flat earth floating through the universe. And Kirk's like, better get Spock up here. Hmm. The nature and limitations of science. Does that look very scientific to you? And uh, of course, Spock is the science officer on the Enterprise, right? That would, that, would, that would blow my mind if I saw that. Do we have a question back there? Cool. All right. You know, uh, from like day one, I, I've always wanted to be a scientist, you know, whether it was um, look, wanting to be an astronomer or as catching little lizards and then hanging them on my ear. But I wanted to be a, a scientist. I just didn't know exactly what it meant to be a scientist or what science was. I was just looking at the pictures of stars and memorizing a few facts. But sometime in the sixth grade, I discovered a book called Cosmos. And there was a TV show also called Cosmos. And I was like, whoa, they made a book from that? The book came first. I didn't know it. But I read this book by uh, Carl Sagan, the late Carl Sagan. He died in the 90s. And he was, a, he was an advocate for science. He was an astronomer, and he advocated for science and the role of science in our lives. And he gave me my first sense of what science was. He said, science is much more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. And this, this is central to a success. And science invites us to just let those facts in, even if they don't confirm, conform to our preconceptions. And uh, when we talk about how we do science, 
or how we science. I love, I prefer to say how we science. Uh, I definitely had my preconceptions blasted away here in the last couple of years. Yeah. I, I dug my heels in. I fought the good fight, but science win, wins. And the word science itself means a desire to know. So it's our pathway. It's a way of understanding the natural world. And if we don't have science, we, we don't know how the world works, right? And uh, not knowing how things work is, is a problem. And, you know, we live in a society that's exquisitely dependent on science and technology. But a lot of us, a lot of people just don't know much about science and technology. And that's a problem. You know, we have people that refuse to get a vaccine because they think that it's unsafe. It'll cause you not to get pregnant. It'll affect the pregnancy. It's new. It's untested. It doesn't work. All of these different things. And they're not evaluating or they're ignoring the information that says, no, that's not true. It is safe. It is effective. It does work. It prevents the spread of COVID or at least keeps you from getting seriously ill. And it doesn't affect uh, being pregnant. Okay. Okay, science is a process. That makes sense, right? What are you guys thinking of? You see, science is a process. What do you think of? The scientific method, right? Yeah. Um, is this a rigid set of steps or what? Nah. You, know, you guys ever watch Pirates of the Caribbean? Parlay, parlay, you know, like what's her name is going parlay and you know, Jeffrey Rush's character, uh, Captain Barbosa, goes parlay, and she like starts quoting the rules of Morgan and Bartholomew, and he goes, "The pirate code is more of a guiding principle. The scientific method is more of a guiding principle, right? It's not a set of rigid steps that everybody follows the exact same way. Lots of people do science, and lots of science is done." In slightly different ways. And in fact, I'm going to give you three examples on Thursday of how we do science that are very different from each other. But in general, we make observations. And then by making observations, we start asking questions, formulating our hypothesis, testing those hypotheses, collecting the data, making conclusions, repeat. Right? That's basically a scientific method, isn't it? pretty much. And then on Thursday, you'll, you'll learn that uh, science is really dependent on curiosity and imagination. And without curiosity and imagination, there's no science. So we'll, we'll talk more about that on Thursday. Now, let me ask you something here. Um, do you think science is limited and what it can tell us about the world? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of myths out there about science, and one of those myths is that science can explain everything. Well, it can't. Science is actually limited to what we call the natural world. And we define the natural world as things phenomena that are at least observable and measurable, or we can at least test for them. Okay, that's the natural world. So like, you know, this ghost crab right here, it, it let me sneak up on it and take a few photos. Normally they scurry away and go right down their holes. But this one hung out and said, okay, you can photograph me. He's probably immortalized. I took this picture like 12 years ago. It's Animals probably long since expired. So he's immortalized. He knew it. Just kidding. But that ghost crap, I can observe it. I can measure it. And if I'm nice, I can do tests to it. You don't want to be mean to it, right? But that's a limitation of science. Uh, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We don't see atoms. But do we know they're there? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've got, you know, 100 years of experiments that have 
shown, the tests that have shown that atoms exist. And what are atoms made of? Oh, come on, guys. Help me out here. Protons, neutrons, electrons. Okay, we're not going to get into quantum physics here where there's you know, the baryonic particles and electronic particles and protons are made up of quarks. And in fact, the whole standard model might get thrown out in the next few years anyways. But I know they're, they're making some wild discoveries over there in CERN. But the point is, is uh, you, you, can, you can test for an electron. We know they exist because we can do tests to show that they exist. So they're part of the natural world. I can't see a radio wave. You guys have radio waves passing through you right now. 104.1, 92.3. That's a really bad country station. Sorry about that. But the point is, uh, they're not magical. We can get a radio telescope and we can detect those radio waves. You just need the right instrument to, to detect them. I can't see a cell. I use a microscope to see it, right? So that's why we use the word potentially. You might you might need a test or some fancy piece of equipment to uh, to know that it's there. However, if I told you the earth is flat on top of some elephants riding on top of a giant sea turtle swimming through the cosmos, but that sea turtle is there. It's turtles all the way down. You just have to believe they're there. Is that very scientific? There's no way to test it, no way to observe it, no way to measure it. Is that scientific? Apollo pulls his sun, the sun across the sky with his chariot. How about that? Is that very scientific? Yeah, so you guys get the idea that science is actually limited to the natural world, right? Good? All right. Science is a broad field. I mean, it encompasses all of these other studies from astronomy, climatology, geology, physics, chemistry, biology. Does your chemistry book still say uh, chemistry, the central science? Yeah, when I was in, in, uh, in college, like 30 years ago, my chemistry book said chemistry, the central science. And the physicists were like, we're the foundational science. And I'm like, you know what? Biology sits on top of all of that. We're the apex science, right? We're the apex of science because we depend on chemistry and physics, right? That's we're going to learn a little bit of chemistry and physics in here. We, I teach my other class over there in Northrop, the geology building, right? So our first section's over there, and I'm like, geology. Life is an extension of geological processes. Yeah, you're an extension of the rock cycle. How do you feel about that, right? I mean, we evolved from metabolically active rocks. Does life affect climate? The atmosphere? Yeah, we got like 22% oxygen, right? For, for life, it'll be like 0.001% oxygen. Is life connected to astronomy, the universe, the sun? Oh, yeah. Every atom in your body was inside of a star 5 billion years ago. How you feel now? That's pretty crazy. Think about it. The carbon inside your body was made inside of a star that lived and died billions of years ago. You're stardust, man. I'm going to come back to this nature and limitations of science, okay? Is that good? We're going we're gonna to go through three examples of how we do science or how we science. Let's talk about biology. I want to just take a step back for a second. One of my interests in life, in addition to diet and exercise and natural history, is astrobiology, the search for life elsewhere in the universe. And when I first got into biology, I always thought that I was a biologist way too late. All the discoveries were made, thinking about Darwin, everywhere he went, everything was new. Well, that's long over. It's actually not. That's the way I was thinking, though. But it's not. But right, right now we're in the golden age of observ. Sorry, the golden age of exploration. Uh, on Christmas Day, Christmas morning, I watched a rocket launch. I hardly ever watch rocket launches, but I watched this one. 
I couldn't hardly sleep the night before. And it wasn't because it was Christmas. They launched a James Webb Space Telescope. I've been following this telescope development for a decade, and it finally launched. And the James Webb Telescope, if the Hubble is this big, the James Webb is the size of this platform here. And it could revolutionize the way we see the cosmos. And it could be it's so powerful that it will detect the atmospheres of planets beyond our solar system. Isn't that crazy? But that's not all we're doing. Uh, we got some rovers on Mars. What are they doing? Going for a dune buggy ride? What are they doing over there? Yeah, they're collecting rock samples. They're looking for signs of life. Some of them are. Others are trying to study the geology and the, and the history of the planet. But yes, some of them are looking for signs of life. In 1977, in January of 78, we launched Voyager 1 and 2. We actually launched Voyager 2 first, then Voyager 1. Seriously, Voyager 2 was launched before Voyager 1. And we, we, went, we sent these probes out to see the, the, the outer solar systems of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. And they gave us our first close-up images. And what they discovered were these moons. They were covered in ice. It's pretty cool. We've been back. We sent Galileo and Juno both to Jupiter. And we're sending the Europa Clipper to study this moon called Europa. Jupiter has lots of moons, but four big ones. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And because there's all these moons, they have all this gravity and gravitational tugging. So it's got friction. And it's warming up these inner moons. So... Oh no, they have ice. They're covered in ice. And what do you think's underneath that ice? More ice? Ice all the way down? What do you guys think? Water. water. Ice is, of course, made of water. And uh, this surface is new. We discovered, it's been turned over. And uh, the Juno probe has actually seen water skewing out of the cracks. This is a moon of Saturn. Nobody expected to find this. Uh, what does that look? New or old? New. There's an ocean underneath there. And they discovered water spewing from it. Salt water, like our oceans. And the scientists said, uh, man, if we only knew before we sent Cassini up there, Cassini was the name of the probe, we would have used it to detect signs of life coming out of this planet, out of this moon. And this, of course, is Mars. Yeah. So we're, we're sending out these probes. We have another satellite. It just, it just uh, expired. It was called the TESS satellite. And it, it detected like over 4,000 planets beyond our solar system. And James Webb is going to check those, those planets out, right? It's going to look for signs of life, oxygen to be specific. So this golden age of exploration, right? I mean, we're looking for signs of life. Beyond our own Earth, it's exciting. And it's so exciting, I'm going to teach a class in astrobiology this fall. Like, I'm, like, super excited about that. And, uh, you know, we always have this idea that alien life looks something like a scene from the Moss Eisley Space Cantina, right, from Star Wars. You know, Luke walks in and sees all these aliens. Would we recognize them as living? Yeah. Are we likely to find this? Unfortunately not. And I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, of course, Moss Eisley is a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. You got to be cautious. Alien life if we saw it. What do you guys think? Would we recognize it? Maybe. Yes, no. Yeah. Well, if we're searching for life, we need to know what life is, right? Isn't that kind of important? This is being a biology class, first chapter. First thing they talk about is what is life? Well, let's see. What does it mean to be living? Hmm, living, that's an interesting way of saying it. Here's what our book says. 
five characteristics. Cells, replication, ener information, energy, evolution. Of course, it has some more descriptors to it, but it says these five characteristics are important for life. What do you think about these characteristics for describing life as a criteria for life? Good, bad, okay, can we do better? Yeah. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's replicating in um, information, your DNA, basically. So this is what the book says. I could use a set of characteristics to describe tent rocks. This is a little blue heron, some Spanish moss and a bald cypress tree is standing on, but little blue heron. Is it different from a rock? Is it different from any other inanimate object in the world? Yeah. Life is different than the non-living, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's something special and unique about life. Do we think we can capture that just by having a list of descriptors? What do you guys think? Yes? Yeah. Do you think we can do better than what the book has? Yeah, it's not that the book is wrong. It's, it's fine. It's just a simple way of thinking about it. But this is where I think it's, it's interesting to think about life a little bit differently. And by thinking about life a little bit differently, helps us look for places where it might be. We not only recognize it, but where it might also be, where we can find it. Can we do better? I think so. Living, um, it's like swimming, right? Running, weightlifting, sleeping, working. It's an action, isn't it? Maybe life is more of an action. Maybe life is a verb. Maybe life is not a noun or an adjective. Maybe to be life is, is this action. What does it, so you start asking this question, well, what does life do? What does it have to do? What do you have to do to be living? I think that's very different from a list of descriptors. So this is a snowy egret. It's a thistle. And that is a, a, a type of coral. It's not a sea anemone. It's, it's distantly related to sea anemones. But you wouldn't find Nemo uh, living in that coral. You guys know Nemo, right? From yeah, finding Nemo. All right. It's like a fixed action response with me. I can't not go here. You know, these cartoons, they love to kill off our parents, right? Like, especially Disney. And, and well, seriously, like Bambi, Lion King, you know, he's killing parents. It's awful. I don't want my kids watching these shows, right? Daddy always comes home after work. But in Finding Nemo, it's Nemo's mom died, right? But clownfish are proto andrus now, proto means first, andri means man. Proto andrus, man first. So all clownfish are born males. And then the bigger, older ones become females. So if Nemo's mom went away and died, Marlin, his dad, would change sex to become a female. And I guess Marlin would become Marlena. <laughs> Okay, well, enough of that. Okay, living. These are all living things. They gotta be doing something. There's a way to think about it. Life uses energy to create order. This is a sea anemone. I just took a photo of it on a rocky coast in California. It's in water. You and I are both ordered. You may not think you're ordered. You may not feel ordered. You may feel pretty scattered, but you're ordered. The water surrounding this, all the water molecules are completely random in motion. The air particles in this room are in complete random motion. Right? They're so random they can even do work, even though each air particle molecule is moving like 200 feet per second or something like that. I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's fast. 
It's enough that it exerts 14 and a half pounds of pressure over every square inch of your body. Point is, is that you are in a sea of chaos. And you are ordered. Life uses energy to create order. You know, when you clean your house, scrub the dishes, put the dishes away, organize your spices. I've used this example three times today. You organize your pizza boxes, you know, by the, you got your Supremes together, you got your pepperonis, right? You got a chicken one up there in a, in a Mediterranean pizza. You organize them so you know which one is which. You guys don't order, organize pizza boxes. You just order it, right? I live out in the country, you know, I don't have pizza delivery, so I have to like go buy them at Walmart and organize them so I know where they're at. The point that I'm trying to make is that to create order, to organize something, you have to do work and that requires energy. So life is using energy to create order. And so all life interacts with this environment. And that's actually the study of ecology. And it, it interacts with this environment. One thing it must do is acquire energy from that environment. If you're a plant, you're getting energy from sunlight. If you're an animal, you're eating, you're eating something. And that's where you're getting your energy from. And so because of these laws of thermodynamics, you can't recycle energy. You guys know the laws of thermodynamics, right? That pesky second law can't. Every time you use energy, it just degrades. So energy flows through life. And I, I can't not make this reference. Like the force flows through a Jedi, right? You cut life off from energy and life dies. Cut a Jedi off from the force and he's no longer a Jedi. Ditto was a pretty smart guy about that. So en energy flows through life. And life uses that energy to create order. We're very ordered systems. Now, you're at home, you're hungry. I'm starving right now. I'm thinking which witch is gonna be in my near future. But if I was at home, I might throw a pizza in the oven, turn up the oven to 425. It's good to cook your pizzas a little bit hot, a little bit less time, crispier crust, just saying. <laughs> I learned that one. Never microwave your pizza, it just turns them into soggy goo. But I'm either microwaving my pizza or I'm, I'm putting it in the oven. Am I adding energy to that pizza? Yeah. Um, can you use that? In, can life use that energy? No. Nope. This is cell and molecular biology. We're going to learn about molecules. And we're going to learn about chemical reactions like cellular respiration. And what life is, is, a, is this, uh, or, or, or these complex chemical reactions, lots of them taking place, trillions and trillions of them every second of every day. So you go eat your pizza. And what happens is through metabolic reactions, specifically catabolic reactions, where you're breaking things down, you're extracting the energy in the food you eat, the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates. And you're through this process of cellular respiration, something that Dr. Adamo will talk about, we're going to transfer the energy in the foods we eat to ATP, the energy currency of life. These are a series of chemical reactions and other reactions and to take place. And then once we break down the proteins into amino acids, we use this energy here to build them up into new proteins. That's anabolism. So catabolism is breaking things down. Anabolism is building things up. And all of these reactions taken together is our metabolism. And that is how we use energy to create order through a series of complex chemical reactions. Now these chemical reactions, they're not a, they're not random. They're governed. There's things that govern them. There's information that does this. And for life on our planet, the information to make every protein our body needs and to regulate the activity of those proteins. How much do you make? When do you make it? When do you not make it? It's stored in our DNA. That's our DNA, okay? So not only does it store information to make proteins, 
It also stores the information to regulate the activities of our cell. Good? We're finding out, you know, that only like a small percent, less than 10% of our DNA actually codes for proteins. A lot of it there is for regulatory purposes. So if you have information, can you copy it? Can you copy information? The answer is yes. Reproduction is very important for life. And the reason why is because reproduction is copying that genetic information to make a new offspring for the next generation. Reproduction ensures the continuity of life. We're good with this? This is something fun to think about. You represent the unbroken lineage, the end result of life going back over 4 billion years, but unbroken lineage. You know what that means, right? It means that your great, 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 had a few billions in their grandparents were bacteria living in the ocean billions of years ago. It's pretty wild, isn't it? So life reproduces. Uh, these are horseshoe crabs. This is the female, this is the male. Did you know that like horseshoe crabs are 450 million years old? Probably older. I mean, that's the oldest fossils we have them. For 450 million years, these living fossils, I know some people don't like that term, but they kind of are, have been returning to the beaches in the spring on a high tide to lay their eggs. They've been doing that 75 million years before the first vertebrates evolved to live on land. Isn't that crazy? I mean, they were doing that before there were animals on land, actually. Now, let me ask you this question. Uh, you're reproducing, you're copying down information. You ever copied down some information wrong? I know I have. got that phone number wrong, messed something up on somebody's notes and missed it on a test. Like, I thought I wrote that down right. It turns out that life evolves over time. And the reason why life can evolve is because there's variation among individuals in a population. Lots of variation. Every time you, you copy the DNA, there's things called mutations. Mutations create variation. So for example, uh, like my daughters and my wife have blonde hair, blue eye, fair skin. They're mutants because they have mutations. So their hair doesn't produce melanin. And their skin doesn't produce as much melanin, so they have fair skin, and their eyes don't produce much melanin. And there's lots of mutations that can lead to that, okay? And that creates variation in the population. And like this Katie did right here, it has evolved to look like a, a dead leaf that's been chewed up. Because any variation that makes it look more like a dead leaf, it's more likely to survive and pass on its genes. And uh, you accumulate those favorable traits over time. So life evolves. Good? All right. So I, I started this out with, uh, we're looking for life elsewhere, out beyond Earth, right? And uh, if you're looking for life, you got to be able to recognize it. What do you guys think? Would we recognize alien life if we saw it? Don't everybody answer at once here. Yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, I gave us a pretty compelling argument for what life does, right? No matter how it looks or what the chemistry is, if we find something doing these things, it's probably living, wouldn't it? Might look really different, but I think we could find it. Okay. So, uh, at the beginning of class, I told you that there's going to be an online test. And the online test is going to require you to, to look up your answers, to go research them, you know, spend some time on them. Don't just regurgitate what you've been, what you've read in the book. 
A good test question would be, would we recognize alien life if we saw it? I just spent 30 minutes talking about it. A B answer doesn't mean you got anything wrong. It just means it might not be a very good answer. So if I asked you something about, would we recognize alien life? And if you gave me some response with this only, it's not wrong, right? It's not a wrong answer, but it's not a very good answer. I would expect more of what I just talked about in lecture, about life using energy to create order through metabolic processes governed by DNA. Good? So that gives you a, a kind of a hint of what I'm looking for. So if you just, you know, you go to write a test answer and you just look up what's in the book, that, that's going to get you a solid B. And for some of you, that's fine. Okay. You want to hear one more way to think about life? There's actually several different ways. Another way is life is an emergent property. It means you're greater than the sum of your parts. That's interesting, isn't it? You're greater than the sum of your parts. I mean, at our most fundamental level, what are we all made of? Atoms. And what are atoms made of? Protons, neutrons, electrons. Let's let's not get into the quantum realm, right? Well, we kind of are in the quantum realm. Let's not go further, but let's say protons, neutrons, and electrons. Three subatomic particles. Let's say I've got two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. What do I have? Element number two? Yeah, helium. Let's say I've got six protons, six carbon, six electrons. What do I have? Carbon, carbon 12. Helium is a is a noble gas, right? Carbon is a solid. So even though they're made up of the exact same three subatomic particles, the different combination of these particles, the elements have different properties, hence emergent property. Uh, how about um, I take sodium? This is always I love this example. Sodium. It's a metal. Put it in water, what happens? Yeah, it hits the fire, doesn't it? Chlorine, it's a gas. Do you want to breathe chlorine? No bad things happen, right? Like you die. Um, but you take sodium and you take chlorine together, what do you get? Table salt. That's an emergent property that's different than its building blocks. So an emergent property is a new property with each higher level of organization, right? Each new level of complexity. Are we good with that? Okay, so... As we're going to learn about cells here in a second, cells are the basic unit of life because life is an emergent property where all of these things happen, and a cell is the most basic unit which all of these things we just talked about happen. So life is a result of an emergent property of a complex system. You are greater than the sum of your parts. And if you don't know what a system is, a system is a series of all these interconnecting components, all these things that work together, defined by a barrier. And for you, your barrier is your skin. For a cell, that barrier would be a cell membrane. Good? And all the reactions that take place in a cell, that would be a system. So we're emergent properties. You really are greater than the sum of your parts. Okay. Now, very quickly here, before we go, I want to talk about three important theories about life. I'm only going to get through two of them. I'm not going to get through evolution today. We'll start that on Thursday. But here's three theories that we need to talk about. Evolution, cell theory, and if you notice, let's not be so dogmatic, central dogma here. And I don't like dogma in science at all. I like paradigms, theories, facts, hypotheses, laws. I do not like the use of the word of the word dogma, and I'll explain why. So let's take a closer look. We'll just do the first one here. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not larger. I I fixed this this morning. Okay, cell theory. Cells are the basic unit of life. That goes back to life is an emergent property, right? So all of those processes, all those things that life does, the smallest unit that does all of those things, the smallest thing that's living is a cell. Life is cellular. Whether it's the bacteria in your belly button or 
<laughs> bacteria like anywhere on you or the biggest blue whale made up of trillions and trillions of cells, all life is made of cells. They're the basic of you know, life. Okay, all cells come from pre-existing cells. That makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward. Has that always been the case? No. There's a time called abiogenesis. A means without, bio means life, genesis means origins. So abiogenesis means origins of life from non-living. That makes sense. So once upon a time, like four billion years ago, life evolved from non-biological systems. It evolved from an extensive geology. But since then, all life has come from cells. And in fact, there's incredibly good evidence that all life on the planet today came from basically a single population of cells that lived about 4 billion years ago. Pretty crazy, huh? Okay. Let's not be so dogmatic. Terms are very important. A hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a set of observations or prediction for an outcome. We'll talk more about that on Thursday. Theories explain how things happen and they're supported by the weight of scientific evidence. Facts are things that actually happen or exist, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. A dogma is a set of principles that is usually gone unquestioned. They don't like that for science. And they don't like the fact that the book uses the word central dogma. The central dogma basically means there's a flow of information inside of our cells. DNA, RNA, proteins. DNA stores genetic information, but it, it does not make proteins. Okay, what you do is you take your DNA, you transcribe messenger RNA, right? We've heard mRNA before, haven't we? In today's world, messenger RNA. Messenger RNA then goes into the cytoplasm of the cell, binds with a large structure called a ribosome, and makes proteins. So there's this flow of information from DNA to RNA to proteins. And this was coined by Watson and Crick, who used Rosalind Franklin's X-ray pictures of DNA to publish the structure of DNA and win the Nobel Prize on it in 1961 for their discovery of DNA structure. And unfortunately, she died in the late 50s of ovarian cancer. And these characters coined the term central dogma to talk about this flow of information from DNA to RNA to proteins. Like I said, dogmatic thinking is often unquestioned. There's problems with dogmatic thinking. Does the flow of information always go from DNA to RNA? Have you heard of this thing called the COVID virus? It's an RNA virus. There's no DNA here. 